Hey, it's Jim, and this is level three of the CFA program, the topic on portfolio management and wealth planning, and the reading on trade strategy and execution. This is part one. I think my biggest challenge in presenting this reading to you is convincing you of its importance. And really the only way I can do that is to refer you to the very first sentence and first paragraph in this reading. Now I'm paraphrasing here, but it says something like, hey, this reading is all about trading from the portfolio manager's perspective. That can mean short term, that can mean long term. And then probably the best way for me to convince you of all of this is to link it back to other LOSs in other readings. Let me, let me show you what I mean here. We're gonna talk about motivations to trade. We've done that since level one. We'll talk about inputs and benchmarks. We've done that since level one. Now we'll do a little bit of a unique approach to trading strategy because we're focusing here not only on the strategic asset allocation of our clients, but also in obtaining the best price, whether it's the buy or the sell. So we'll look at some interesting things about trading strategy. And then we'll talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, which, which we've done before. We'll do all that here in part one. So before we start, let me go ahead and give you a visualization. Back in the old days, and when I mean old days, I'm saying like 100 years ago or so, if, uh, if, if you had uh, an idea to buy shares of stock as a portfolio manager, what you had to do is you had to actually you know, run to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And depending on how fast you were, somebody else who had the exact same idea at the exact same time, maybe they were faster than you. And so I want you to think about this. If they get to the New York Stock Exchange ahead of you, the specialist, you know, they were called specialists back in the old days. They would see that this dude is getting ready to buy whatever it is, 100 shares. And then he would look out and see you huffing and puffing. And he would think, oh, there's Jim out there. He's going to buy. So he's going to change the price. So the faster dude gets the better price. Well, this was true for many, many years. And in fact, when I went through the program, you know, this is 20 some years ago, uh, we didn't have any of these LOSs, you know, most of them were, you know, like limit orders and stop loss orders. At least that's my memory of it uh, that far ago, that far long ago. But somewhere around 2005, there was a law that was passed in the United States that allowed for anybody, almost anybody to create a, a stock exchange. And it really, really promoted the use of, uh, algorithms and machine learning and high frequency trading and all that kind of cool stuff. And so now, now it's not how fast we can run to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. It's, it's how many milliseconds it takes us to go from point A to point B. And a handful of milliseconds is worth, oh, I don't know, millions of dollars. But that's not part of the LOS. But I still want you to get the sense that the faster that we can get to the exchange and, uh, which exchange that we want to route our orders to, that's probably a big issue as well. So think about what I've just said in the context of, how about if I say it this way, everything else you've learned in the, in the CFA program. <clears throat> All right, just a quick recap of what we did back in level one and level two. Oh boy, ways of optimizing trade strategies. You know, we did electronic trading back in the late 60s and 70s. Then we did algorithm trading. You know, that started, I don't know, 20 some years ago. And then we have machine learning, which is maybe over the last decade or so. How about factors that influence these optimal trading strategies? Our motivation, we'll talk at length about that. Trade urgency, which is the subject of multiple questions at the end of this reading. Order characteristics, this is what I was referring to back in the old days, market conditions. We've talked about those for many, many times uh, over many, many uh, levels, risk aversion. Trading costs, I'm guessing you remember, explicit costs and implicit costs. Um, I say this to you regularly. I'm going to go ahead and repeat it. What does the Institute like us to do? They want us to do things like review. They want us to do things like disclose. They want us to do things like monitor. And they want us to do things like document. So uh, our trading procedures uh, ought to be appropriately documented. 
our focus throughout this part one and part two will be motivations, uh, strategy, selection, implementation, cost measurement, and evaluations. So let's go ahead and start in on that first LOS, uh, motivations to trade. <clears throat> Now, we have a handful of slides on each of these little boxes here. I'll just do these quickly now. Profit seeking, of course, risk management and hedging, cash flow needs. And then uh, another category, which is like, you know, everything else that doesn't fit into those first three categories. Notice that bottom bullet point there, the second to the bottom. Motivations guide the formation of trading strategies. So that's what we're going to do over the next handful of slides. We're going to have a motivation and then we're going to decide how we're going to uh, execute that particular strategy. Now, the section here on profit seeking in the reading is very interesting because it clearly links all the stuff that we've been doing in level one and level two. So active managers, of course, what are we trying to do? I mean, this is not rocket science. We're trying to buy low and sell high. We're using all of our skill set, all of our resources, all of our intelligence to identify securities that are mispriced. If they're underpriced, we'll buy. If they're overpriced, we will short. And of course, the reading then references uh, the alpha that is a goal of active managers. Now, the interesting part of this is what I just described is all long term stuff but there are profit seeking motives in the short term. And that's pretty much the focus of many parts of this reading. In other words, when we have that instant in our brain and we say something like, all right, here's a client, I've done all this work and I'm gonna allocate a hundred shares of Apple to this particular client. So as soon as it hits your brain, you look and see what the price is. So that price is whatever the price is, right? And then by the time you run to the floor, well, Apple's on the NASDAQ exchange. By the time you run uh, to the NASDAQ exchange, maybe that price is much higher or much lower. So we need to make certain that we consider how fast can we run to that exchange. There are multiple questions at the end of this reading that focus on things like trade urgency, alpha decay, dark pools, transparent venues. So this is probably, let me just go back here. This stuff here, long term, we know from level one and level two, this stuff here, trading urgency, that sounds an awful lot like we want to run to the exchange faster than anybody can. So look at those first couple of block points. Speed of executing orders, faster execution is key for capturing profits. Of course, the lower that you get in to buy, then the more wiggle room you have for that uh, share of stock to increase. Now, this concept of alpha decay is uh, really a cool thing in the short term. So let's suppose that, what did we decide a minute ago? We were gonna buy 100 shares of Apple. Well, let's suppose we're one of 10 people, 10 portfolio managers who have decided to buy 100 shares of Apple. Well, how fast can each of us get to that exchange? And, and by the way, we don't have to go to NASDAQ. We could, we could go to our neighborhood exchange, right? That might be over here somewhere. Well, that neighborhood exchange, that might not be the best price. So we need to kind of shop around. And one of the cool things about this is that, you know, the fastest way to do all this is to find an exchange that is located somewhere near some kind of a router or some other kind of, uh, of a mechanism under which we don't have to uh, go like this and this and this and this. You know, even electronically, that, that kind of delays the time. That's what I was saying earlier about those, uh, about those milliseconds. Here, look at uh, block points. What is that? Four and five. This is a question at the end of the reading. High urgency linked to short-term strategy. Of course, you want to sprint to get there short-term. Low urgency is linked to long-term strategy. So this is the image I give my students. I say, let's suppose that you hit the lottery and you show up on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with a wheelbarrow full of money, right? And you get in line at the uh, at the specialist, they used to call them specialists. Now they're just kind of regular old market makers on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. But now you get in line and the person over there looks back and sees you with this wheelbarrow full of money. 
Well, what is that? Uh, what is that trader going to do? That trader is going to say, "Well, you know what? You've revealed something to me that's valuable information, so the price is going to change to to his benefit or her benefit, and and to my detriment." Right. So we we want to hide trades, which means we want to be like James Bond. You know, we want to go. Although James Bond is a very very well known secret agent, everybody seems to know who he is. So we want to be a secret agent and go where nobody knows what we're doing, and nobody knows if we're buying or selling, and nobody knows what our volume is. What that means then is we're going to shop around all these exchanges and we're going to go to less transparent venues, ah, such as these dark pools. Now, these dark pools concepts, you know, which are only about 20 years old or so, you know, these, these things are fascinating. You know, every investment banking firm has their kind of own dark pool in there where it's dark because they know what's going on in there, but we don't know what's going on in there. They were just really trying to match orders inside of their investment banking universe. Uh, but that, that's why they're considered to be less transparent. So we want to hide ourselves, right? So trading urgency, what do we want to do? We want fast execution, but we don't want to reveal uh, the size and the direction of our trade. Now, the reading goes on to talk about the, uh, the Michigan Index of Consumer Sentiment. We read about this in the Wall Street Journal all the time. Uh, this is short term. Remember that short term. So imagine that the Institute might give you this uh, Michigan index, but they might just give you Jim's index. So if you hear this consumer sentiment on the exam, remember, remember short term. If we talk about value investing, which is what I was mentioning just a few minutes ago, then then think about uh, think about long term. All right, so how about the second motivation, risk management? What does that mean? That means that we have these clients and they have a risk objective and they have a return objective, which remember, uh, can change over their lifetime. And so we're going to uh, adjust and rebalance the portfolio depending on the changes in those risk objectives. Now, remember what the Institute likes is for us to say something like, all right, we're gonna have this uh, strategic allocation to, let's say, large cap equities of between 15 and 20 percent. All right. So naturally, prices go up and down. And so sometimes it's 15, sometimes it's 18, sometimes it's 20 percent. But when it falls down to 12 percent or increases to 22 percent, then we need to adjust back inside of that strategic range. Now, coupled with that is the uh, tactical asset allocation where we might have some leeway in there and maybe uh, in the short term go up to 25% or go down to 10% or something like that. But I'm guessing that the Institute would use the what we have emboldened there down the bottom left, target risk levels. Of course, portfolio managers use risk horizons, right? We have, we have a time horizon constraint associated with the policy statement. Uh, there's the bullet point up there green about preset risk boundaries. So we might have this strategic uh, allocation. What did I say? 15 to 20 percent. But we might have something that says, you know what we want? We have a target standard deviation of 17 percent. Maybe that range is 16 to 21 percent and maybe it goes up, maybe it goes down. So we have these preset risk boundaries. I would imagine the Institute would tell you something like, hey, we're going to use standard deviation, um, but we could use beta. We could use value at risk. We could use semivariance. We could use any other kind of risk tool that we've learned about throughout the uh, throughout the program. Of course, we can do all sorts of hedging. This will uh, change our tactical asset allocation derivatives. We've learned about this for a long, long time. Very cost effective. Remember now, when you use a forward contract or you use a futures contract or you use a swap contract, these things are pretty cheap. Options, on the other hand, they can be kind of salty, as my, uh, as my close friend and my insurance agent tells me. Salty means that it can be really, really expensive. So what you need to do when you're deciding on the methods of hedging is not only what that outcome is. Of course, you do all sorts of uh, uh, sensitivity analysis to see, you know, think about an Excel spreadsheet where you have all these different kinds of outcomes. Make sure you consider the cost of an option. 
Now, what about leverage? Of course, if we're using derivatives, that means we're increasing our leverage. Uh, if we're using margin accounts, if we're using a home equity loan to add to our portfolio, please don't ever do that, but lots of people, I guess, out there do. So highly levered funds require uh, much more close monitoring because they're way more sensitive to things like changes in inflation, changes in interest rates. Cash flow needs, make sure you're aware that this could be cash inflows and cash outflows. So every portfolio manager, whether you have individual clients or institutional clients, or you're a mutual fund or a hedge fund manager, you constantly have money coming in and you constantly have money going out. And so uh, that portfolio trading is driven by those cash flow needs, right? Investor subscriptions and redemptions. Yeah, this trade urgency, what did we say earlier? Low trade urgency or high trade urgency, um, you know, this can be a function of the cash flow needs. You know, suppose you have a client who has a margin call or some collateral, an increase in collateral. Well, oh my gosh, we've got to do something and we got to do it now, right? So there's, uh, there's high trade urgency. And then client, uh, client driven trades. You probably heard this example that I like to give many, many times. I do this in my class all the time. Suppose you have a client says, hey, I need $100,000 to build a swimming pool in my backyard. Well, there you go. You got to sell $100,000 worth of uh, uh, whatever stock is out there. Now, of course, coupled, here, let me go back here quickly, coupled with these cash flow needs, you know, you think about it, you got cash flows coming in and out and you have cash sitting right there. And it might not be the best time to enter the floor of the New York Stock Exchange for whatever reason. So if you have this cash just sitting on your desk, it's going to uh, result in some kind of a cash drag. And so the easiest thing to do, the absolute easiest thing to do is take that cash, pick up the phone, call one of these organized exchanges and say, hey, I want to take the long position in an equity index futures contract. So there's that uh, equitization mitigates the, the cash drag. So there's the example you can use futures or you can just use ETFs or there's other stuff out there that you can use. Coupled with this idea of cash drag is the larger concept of liquidity management. Of course, any portfolio manager would love to have tons and tons of cash sitting on his or her desk to meet those cash outflows. Client says, hey, I need a bunch of money. And you just reach onto the top of your desk and say, oh, okay, here it is. But of course, that's going to increase the cash drag. So liquidity management is really nothing more than we learned back in level one. It's a marginal cost, marginal benefit kind of a decision making a process, satisfy fund flows, minimize cash drags. Um, yeah, hedge funds, we know they have those, uh, we have those lockup periods. Now, client redemptions, if we're talking about some kind of um, an institutionalized fund like a hedge fund or a mutual fund that's based on net asset value calculated on uh, closing market prices. Now, what happens then is if you think about it, you know, if a client says, if a shareholder says, hey, I want out of this mutual fund and at the end of the day, the net asset value is, you know, whatever it is, let's say 20. Well, how do you how do you redeem? How do you send that that shareholder all of his or her capital? Well, you probably sold during the course of the day. Maybe you sold at a higher price. Maybe you sold at a lower price. So there's that pocket in there of potential losses in between the selling price at the end of the during the course of the day. And remember, this could go all the way up to four o'clock uh, Eastern time here in the United States. Security selection, of course, we want to worry about trade size. We don't want to show up on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with a wheelbarrow full of money. We need to worry about how many people are in line uh, at the trading post on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. There's, you know, security liquidity. If we get up there with a wheelbarrow full of money and there's nobody else buying or selling, then we're probably in big trouble, or at least we can make a conclusion that there's probably less liquidity than we want. If there's a hundred people in line, well, then that's good for liquidity. And then the cost of trading, we talked about that a minute ago, risk return trade-offs. So trading to meet cash flows, right? Optimal risk return, marginal costs, and marginal benefits. And here, let me pause and say something. 
You know, when I talk about risk and expected return inside of uh, my investments class, when we're talking about the policy statement and trying to find objectives for a particular client, this risk return trade-off typically happens in, in the long term right? You know, expected return versus standard deviation or beta, whether you're doing capital market line or security market line. But here in this context, um, this risk return is truly a marginal cost, marginal benefit in the, in the historical economic sense, because it's very, very short term, right? One day. Now, here's this category I was saying to you earlier about, you know, this is kind of everything else that doesn't fit into those uh, into those first three. So what happens if uh, if two firms merge? Let's just take a simple example. We own stock in A and we own stock in B. They merge to form stock company C. Well, these shares, we got to trade those in these shares. We got to trade those in and then we get shares of the new firm. So mergers, spinoffs, takeovers, acquisitions, equity carve outs, any of those kinds of things are going to ne necessitate trading. And then, of course, we've got dividend reinvestments and we have uh, coupon reinvestments, fund distributions. There's margin calls. We talked about that just uh, just a little bit. Remember that you know you have kind of two choices with the margin call. You can just uh, tell your client, "Hey, I need cash." That makes perfect sense. Uh, or you can say to the client, "Hey, you got anything in your garage that's worthwhile?" And the client might say something like, "Oh, I have the Pink Panther diamond that I stole from one of those Pink Panther movies." Uh, here it is. Let's use that as collateral. So then you got to worry about all this kind of uh, security around the collateral. Of course, if your client has the Pink Panther diamond as collateral, then you pretty much don't have to worry about uh, almost anything that we're talking about here. Uh, how about derivative contract expirations? Uh, I was teaching in the Midwest right after I got my PhD and uh, uh, I had a student come to me and said that he w did an internship the previous summer for one of the firms in Chicago and uh, somehow somebody forgot <clears throat> to inform the important people that they wanted to close out the long position <clears throat> in a Barrows and Gilts futures contract. And so uh, what happened is a truckload of little piglets showed up uh, at this guy's farm. And uh, so remember, remember, you, you have this contract expiration. Let's keep track of those expiration dates and let's settle. Let's settle these. But of course, they're probably going to have uh, they're probably going to have some cash implications at the end. But also remember that there are there are daily settlements. Now, of course, you get around that by just throwing some Treasury securities at the exchange and they they take that as uh, uh, as their margin or their collateral. Now, how about if we're a passive fund manager and we say we're going to invest in the 500 stocks in the S&P 500 stocks? Well, what happens? We, we know this regularly from reading the Wall Street Journal. They'll tell us that, oh, these three firms dropped out and these three firms replaced them. Of course, with the Wilshire 5000 index, it's a little bit more complex because I don't know that there have ever been 5,000 stocks in the Wilshire 5,000. Nowadays, there might be like 3,400 in there, but still sometimes uh, companies go in, sometimes companies uh, go out. So changes in the benchmark index. All right, so key inputs to a trading strategy. So order characteristics, security characteristics, market conditions, individual risk aversion. I want you to take a step back here, or at least uh, mentally take a step back and ask yourself the question, each of those four little right angle points down at the bottom, those are key elements in the CFA program. We've talked about risk aversion. We've talked about the economics of market conditions. We've talked about security characteristics like coupon rate and yield to maturity and beta and dividend yield. And now we're talking about order characteristics. What does that mean? Well, it's a simple buy or sell order, but they're all different sorts of ways to execute those order characteristics. So which direction there's the buy sell what is the size how about the relative size i mean think about it if we show up on the floor of the new york stock exchange with a wheelbarrow full of money and we get in line and everyone around us has dump trucks full of money 
Well, the size, we might think, hey, we got a ton of capital in here inside of our wheelbarrow, but that person over here that has a dump truck. All right, so relative size uh, is super important. Security characteristics, right? The, we've talked about this regularly, but here, here's some of the key elements inside of this particular reading. Look at that bottom part in the, in the blue box. Varying costs, varying regulations, varying liquidity, different kinds of markets, and all the different kinds of securities that we know that we can trade. There we go, short-term alpha, yeah. Trade urgency, look in the very middle of that green box, right? Trade urgency is influenced by that alpha decay. So remember, alpha decay is a short term. Now, this might be measured in milliseconds, right? So think about that. It doesn't really matter how fast you can run to the New York Stock Exchange. What is that line of the high fiber net network, high, whatever that thing is, going right directly uh, to the exchange? Volatility, we'll talk a little bit about this in a future slide, but sometimes if there's low volatility, we might just want our regular old algorithm to execute a strategy and say, you know what, I'm just going to press a button. There's not much volatility out there, so I don't really need a complex algorithm to trade. But if prices are going way up and way down and way up and way down, I might need some extra special lines of code inside of that algorithm to manage, well, look in the purple, right? Greater execution risk. That sounds like a great exam question. In fact, one of the comments that are made in the end of this reading, hey, price volatility means greater execution risk. Of course, you want to agree with that. And then security liquidity, you know, there are a lot of different ways to measure this. So average trade size, that's one way. Another way would be uh, the difference between the high and the low during the course of the day, any kind of a range that you want to make. But then, of course, the, the most common is through uh, bid-ask spread, uh, excuse me, the bid-ask spread, and then you can use uh, ADV as well. Market conditions, what do we need to think about? Think about our recent past, think about COVID, think about high levels of inflation and substantial changes in inflation, think about uh, any kind of market event out there. Seasonality, that's an important one. Remember now, <clears throat> this is a great exam question to link these trading strategies with the seasonality components that we did back in uh, our quantitative methods discussions. Individual risk aversion, of course, more risk averse traders have a higher trade urgency. That purple diamond point, that sounds like a great exam question. Of course, of course, if we have a client that says something like, oh, you know what, I really, I really don't want to invest in equity securities. They're just too risky. And so we go through this long process of convincing our client, uh, you know what, let's do 5% of your portfolio in large cap stocks. And you've heard of all of these companies. So that client, we're going to have to try to get in there uh, pretty quickly. Higher trade urgency. Trader's dilemma. How many times do I do this in, in readings, right? How do I down, balance the wheelbarrow slash dump truck presentation to the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and increasing the exposure to market risk, right? You know, it's better to hide and stay away, but suppose the price moves against us uh, inside of that dark pool or on some kind of an exchange. What's the solution? Best price time trade-off based on current conditions and those order characteristics. Now, the problems at the end of this reading have a good focus on this particular LOS. Compare benchmarks. Now, we know benchmarks all the way back from level one, right? If we're, if we're uh, managing the S&P 500 index, mutual fund, well, then our benchmark is the S&P 500 index uh, itself. What we're doing here is we're taking that kind of a global approach to the word benchmark and then applying it to each individual decision that we make. So go back to, what did I say? How many, what was that, 20 minutes ago? Go back, what were we gonna do? We were gonna buy 100 shares of Apple. 
Well, what kind of a benchmark price are we going to use based on the instant that we decide to buy those 100 shares of Apple for our client? Well, why do we need this benchmark? Well, we need a standard for comparison, right? Informed trading decisions, optimizing the trading spread, and then evaluating, monitoring and evaluating and reviewing our performance. We need some kind of a benchmark. You know, so what are we going to do, right? We're going to figure this out so that we can determine our actual trading costs, but our expected trading costs, right? There's a good standard deviation measure there. Optimal trade strategies. All right, so this makes perfect sense. So what are we going to do for this benchmark? We can also think of these as reference prices. We can do it pre-trade. We can do it post-trade. We can do it inside of the day, or we can do it... <clears throat> with a price target. So let's go ahead and start with these pre-trade benchmarks. So decision price, this is what I was saying earlier, pointing to my temples. It's the price of the security at the moment the manager decided to buy or sell it. All right, so there's one pre-trade benchmark. We haven't executed yet, we've decided to execute. Well, we can use the previous closing price from yesterday but if that price was at four o'clock yesterday and it's now 3.58, two minutes before four o'clock closing, well, a lot could have happened. That's probably not a good benchmark. Maybe, uh, maybe previous close is the least of all of these appropriate pre-trade benchmarks just because of the time period. Opening price, that might be a good one. Arrival price, so that when you, we say, okay, I'm gonna buy the shares, 100 shares of Apple, and then we hit the button down here. How long does that take? Well, that takes me, I don't know, two seconds, but how many milliseconds are there? Oh my gosh, I'm not that smart, but I bet some of you guys have already figured that out. Uh, that would be the arrival price. Uh, intraday benchmarks. These are important based on what's going on during that particular day. What could go on? There could be lots of volatility. There could be no volatility. There could be huge events in individual sectors. There could be no events in individual sectors. But notice uh, what I just described there can be used under passive trading, seeking liquidity, and risk minimization. So let's go ahead and figure out what are two of these intraday benchmarks. What we can do is we can just say something like, you know what? I don't really care about volume. All I care about is how many trades have happened during the course of the day, and I'm gonna take the average. So look under time-weighted average price over there in green. This is equal weighted. So think about this, time-weighted and equal weighted, they're, they're the same thing uh, of all trades executed over that trading period. Now it could be a day, it could be an hour, right? Now suppose we're concerned about volume what we want to do is we want to go ahead and volume weight that average price so that periods of high volatility have a greater influence on this benchmark, right? So average daily execution price scaled by its volume. Now, which one of these are we going to choose? Compare benchmarks. We're going to choose the volume weighted if we're sensitive to volume. If in fact we show up with our wheelbarrow full of money and there's nobody there, right? Well, that's low volume. We're going to have a great impact on that, right? But if we show up with that wheelbarrow and there's a hundred people with dump trucks, well, then we probably don't care about it. If those dump trucks are all equally weighted, we'll probably use that time weighted one. Now, post-trade benchmarks, this is done after the trade is completed. Maybe it's the closing price. We, we have to use the closing price, right, if we're, uh, if we're a mutual fund or a hedge fund. Uh, and finally, we can use some kind of a price target. We can say something like, oh, you know what? Based on my uh, opinion, my observation, my experience of what goes on during the course of the day, up and down, up and down, I'm going to just set the target price. I'm going to say, you know what? This is a summation of all this stuff. With Here, let me go back here real quickly. This is a summation of uh, seeking liquidity. It's a consideration of risk and the optimization processes that I have worked through. Might be passive trading, might be active trading, but if I go here, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and pick that price. 
what it does is it says something like, oh yeah, here's that price. I think that's, think of it as like the, the true price. <clears throat> what that means then is we can use that to compare against our performance. So we're gonna either meet or beat that benchmark price. And this is gonna help us generate that short-term alpha. <clears throat> All right, how about select and justify a trading strategy? You guys know watching my videos, level one, level two, now level three, that I'm a big fan of all the stuff that the, that the Institute presents us, but every once in a while they throw something at us. I have no idea why they would have put uh, given relevant facts in parentheses there. I don't know, it just, uh, it caused me a little bit of a chuckle, of course, given, given relevant facts. Um, but I went to the reading and you look at the problems at the end and there's a question in there in which they give specific facts and ask you to justify a trading strategy. Uh, anyway, just my little, uh, little way that my brain kinds of thinks. All right, so what are these desi desired trade outcomes? Of course, what we wanna do is we want to meet or beat our benchmark, depending on which one we selected, uh, in those previous slides. So there we go, quick profit, and then maybe rebalancing a fund. So for short-term alpha, what are we trying to do? This urgency level is super high, right? What we're gonna do is we're going to try, we're going to attempt to find a price imbalance on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. So look down the bottom left. These are liquid equity markets to get this short-term alpha. Because remember, if we have uh, illiquid, some kind of an other market, at the very least, we're going to have super wide bid-ask spreads, and that's probably going to prevent us from uh, achieving any kind of a short-term alpha. So how are we going to do this? Of course, we're going to, when we hit this button, we're going to have uh, some type of an algorithm uh, that routes us to the best exchange or the best dark pool or wherever that is. Now, long-term alpha, on the other hand, this is exactly what the, we talk about at length in the policy statement. Execute long-term trades following fundamental changes. That makes perfect sense. Urgency level is low because we're inside of that. Let's just assume we're inside of that uh, strategic asset allocation range. Price references, this is probably way more complex than in the short term. Uh, what we'll probably do is we'll show up on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange with what appears to be empty pockets. And then when we get up there, we'll just go ahead and reach into our back pocket and say, uh, here's, we want to buy 100 shares of, uh, of Target or whatever that is, right? So minimize information spillover and price pressure. Once again, I think the visualization of a wheelbarrow or a dump truck full of cash, I think that helps you answer uh, lots and lots of questions. All right, how about risk rebalance? You know, what we're gonna try to do is we're going to try to take this these macroeconomic factors like inflation and GDP and exchange rates and uh, and political influence into capital markets. And we're gonna to try to lessen that risk. Our urgency level is probably not low, it's probably not high, it's probably moderate. Our price reference is uh, risk rebalance. So our price reference is probably gonna be the equal weighted, right, or the time weighted. Uh, execution method, maybe we'll go ahead and use some kind of a time weighted algorithm you know, uh, over this long term, we could go back and perhaps even use some kind of artificial intelligence or machine learning. We'll go ahead and talk about that in just a minute. All right, how about cash flow driven? We'll do client rejections and new trades here in just a second. This is what I was saying earlier. What do we want? We want lots and lots of cash on top of our desk, but that gives us cash drag and it also is tremendous opportunity cost. So we have these client redemptions. We want to have a partial sale of every position inside of our fund. Urgency level is probably moderate. That price, re price reference almost always is going to be the net asset value. And what we're going to do is we're going to submit our orders. What did I say earlier? We probably don't want to submit them at one o'clock or two o'clock. We want to submit them, you know, at uh, 3.59 and uh, 59 seconds and seven uh, milliseconds. 
cash flow driven on the new trade mandate. You know, remember we get tons and tons of funds from our clients. So what are we going to do? Well, our urgency might be high, might be low. It's probably going to be depending on what our client preferences are. Um, yeah, liquidity is probably low because we can uh, execute those trades by the end of the day. We have lots of time to do that. Uh, performance measurement begins at the current day's closing price execution method, boy, long positions uh, to avoid cash drag. That makes sense. High touch trading. We've got low touch trading and we have high touch trading. High touch means that it's me. It's an individual. I'm Jim. I'm out there and I'm going to do it. Low touch trading just means some kind of an algorithm in there. You know, so look at that second box in there. This is probably the important one provides personalized service and the broker's expertise high touch trading. So yeah, direct involvement of human traders. It's got to be more expensive. Uh, gives us the advantage of negotiating prices. Probably way more uh, beneficial in highly illiquid markets. And then we can adapt our strategies. Electronic trading. This is low touch trading. So we just hit a button. Computer algorithms. What we can do is execute these trades. Mostly these are executed for simple trades by 100 shares of Apple. Uh, we can execute these trades at much higher frequency. Potential advantage in fast moving markets. Yeah, cost effective. That makes perfect sense. Reduces the risk of human error. Remember, we talk a little bit about, you know, this operational risk, which includes human error and more, pre more precise control algorithmic trading. Yeah, beneficial in liquid markets. I remember that. So back here, what did we have? This is a great question. High touch trading beneficial in illiquid markets. Uh, electronic trading beneficial in uh, liquid markets, right? Lacks the ability to, to adapt, lacks the nuance and flexibility of a human trader. So once again, in this short term, marginal costs and marginal benefits, does the client want or need or will benefit from this high touch trading, lots and lots of extra costs, but there are benefits there. So this is really just a simple microeconomics graph. All right, high touch trading. There are two kinds here, principal trades and agency trades. There's the difference there. Uh, make sure you know the difference. Electronic trading, these are all order driven, just like we've been talking about so far. Uh, the algorithm, algorithmic trading, these are program trades. Uh, what we're going to do, of course, this is minimal human intervention more accurately and swiftly. What are the objectives? Trading strategies, minimize human errors, increase trade efficiency. We have execution algorithms, which want to get us there the fastest. This is what I was talking about earlier. But profit seeking algorithms, this is where we might use we might use some kind of machine learning over time to find out what the securities we ought to buy and sell and at what time. Remember machine learning, we just throw a bunch of stuff in there and we tell the, the machine, hey, you figure it out. And what that does is it allows the machine to learn and then we learn from the machine and then we can uh, we can generate extra profits through this uh, through this algorithm. All right, the selection criteria, order size, liquidity, urgency, risk tolerance. Th these are the same uh, what we've talked about before. How about scheduled algorithms? What do we want to do with these things? We want to schedule these when we know what kind of trading volume is out there right? And it's not going to be super high. It's not going to be super low. On the other hand, if we know that there are periods of high volume or low volume, then we want to probably put together a volume weighted average price algorithm. Lots of times during regular trading days, we'll just do uh, an equal weighted or a time weighted. Now, this uh, percent of volume algorithm, this is really interesting. It's almost, I don't want to say this here, I don't want to throw you off, but it's almost a combination of the green and the blue, almost. Remember now the time weighted, that kind of just, that ignores volume. But instead of, instead of the volume weighted, it looks at a percentage of volumes and um, 
The disadvantage here is that there might be higher costs. Yeah, this is what I was saying earlier. So applications of scheduled algorithms, small orders, and highly liquid markets with low urgency. That sounds like a really great exam question. You just have the schedule when you have a regular, a regular old market. But then if you have markets in which there is high liquidity or low liquidity, you can have liquidity seek seeking algorithms suitable for large, low liquidity and high urgency trades. Notice the bottom there. Once again, minimize the market impact. How about these arrival price algorithms? We're going to not show up with a wheelbarrow full of money. We're going to have an arrival price algorithm where we're going to say something like, boy, we know we're in a liquid market. We know, we know that there's going to be a price movement probably against our decision. And we want to get there as soon as possible. So we want to trade as close to the current price as possible. Ooh, dark strategies, liquidity aggregators. Yeah, these for large orders in illiquid markets. Um, avoids informa information leakage. Uh, find liquidity in dark pools. Uh, there's a disadvantage at the bottom. Those orders may go unfilled. You know, this is what we know about these these dark strategies is that you could I suppose you want to buy a thousand shares. So you're probably not going to you're probably not going to send that one thousand share order into the dark pool. Maybe you'll say you'll send 100 shares just to kind of see what's going on inside of the darkness there. And that order might get uh, gobbled up right away or it might just sit there if it gets gobbled up right away and then you say oh well there are people out there buying and then you throw the other 900 in there well you're probably gonna have to you're gonna probably have to pay a higher price because the people inside of that dark pool they suspect that you're testing the market this is really cool stuff, by the way. And when I was going through the program hundreds of years ago, none of this stuff was a part of the LOS is probably because what I was saying earlier, I think that 2005 rule law here in the US kind of created all this stuff. I want to call your attention to one of those in text questions that the Institute provides us right here after it talks about uh, smart order routers. I want you to think about this trading algorithm selection and class in the following manner. Let's think about these microstructure <clears throat> variables that we have tremendous amounts of data on, right? A bid ask spread, maybe tick size, maybe depth of the order, maybe volatility, maybe trading volume. So you have all these um, data points. What we want to do is try to determine which ones of those data points are relevant, which ones are irrelevant, which ones can help us identify the most efficient trading algorithm. So what the Institute does, it reminds us of what we learned back in machine learning clustering, right? What we're going to do is we take all of these data points and we essentially plot them, maybe not in a two dimensional graph, maybe in a nine dimensional graph. And what we do is we want to try to find clusters, right? So maybe for one uh, particular scenario that tick size and bid ask spread forms a cluster. Well, that's important information for us to identify what the most efficient trading algorithm is going to be. So remember clusters tries to place these data points into a cluster. And remember, in machine learning, we don't have any idea about the characteristics underlying those individual data points, nor do we really care when we're performing this, uh, this process. And then the next part of it goes into high frequency market forecasting. And what these are models that are hopefully going to show us what that direction of the short term market is. Um, the reading and this in text example talks about lasso, the least absolute shrinkage and selection, right? So what we're doing here, and by the way, those of you who are Seinfeld fans, you can't hear the word shrinkage and not think of George uh, getting out of the swimming pool. But remember in this lasso, what we're doing is we're going to identify a parameter. It's called Lambda. 
and that parameter is kind of like a shrinkage parameter. And if lambda is zero, then this model looks uh, exactly like ordinary least squares. But what it tries to do is it shrink, shrinks, right? Just like George and Seinfeld, it shrinks so we can identify which of those data points, which of those variables are important. Like what did I say earlier? You know, maybe bid ask spread. And, and trading volume. So these are two ways to identify the important microstru microstructure variables that will lead us, lead us to determine what is optimal. All right, so here's simple advantages uh, and disadvantages, higher trade execution, reduced uh, risk and manual errors. Ah, look at that third bullet point there under advantage. You know I say this regularly, I love it. When the Institute links some topic like trading algorithm class to behavioral finance. So minimizes the emotional and psychological impacts. Remember, cognitive errors up here, emotional biases here. That's a great exam question. Disadvantages vulnerable to technical glitches. Didn't we have, you know, I don't know, was it five or six years ago, we had uh, the Dow drop by a thousand points for about a period of 17 seconds or something, and then it rebounded. So a technical glitch. Ah, risk of over-optimization or curve fitting. Remember when we talked about machine learning and artificial intelligence, we talked about underfitting and overfitting. Well, this is gonna be the problem here when we don't have the exact relationships that we think that we have. And that takes us through all of our first five learning outcome statements. We'll go ahead and uh, continue here with the last four or so to finish up part two. So normally what I ask you to do now after part one is go to those uh, 20 some questions at the end of the reading. I'm gonna give you a respite here. I don't want you to do that because the way those questions are presented is they really are sprinkled of all of the LOSs. So I don't want you to get confused about the second part and the first part. So let's go ahead and just shut down. What I want you to do now is uh, take some time off, maybe 10 minutes, and then go watch part two. And then I'll have you go work through all of these problems. So, hey, thanks for watching. Have a great day and good luck studying. I will end with this. When I went through the program 100 years ago, this was kind of a dull topic, I thought, and uh, I wasn't really interested in it. But now that things have changed dramatically, I, I think this is super interesting. And so it's a relatively new concept, relatively new reading. So I'm going to go ahead and emphasize uh, to you to make sure that you work on these LOSs. So, hey, thanks again. Good luck studying.